welcome to the Kit Plus Show. My name is Darren, I'm from the IABM, and we're going to talk about the business of broadcaster media today. Um, the IABM produces lots of tools to help our members understand what's going on in the industry um, and understand what's happening in the marketplace so that they can stay best advised of what's happening and understand the key drivers behind the business. So we're going to look at three things today. Uh, the drivers of change on the business environment, uh, buying trends uh, and what uh, customers are actually buying right now and why, and ultimately how that's affecting the supply chain. So the, these are the headlines. This is, this is my whole presentation in one slide, so you can take a picture and go if you wish. Um, but this is what's happening right now. So what we call um, digital warfare is um, all the content owners fighting for eyeballs on the OTT space. And uh, we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. Then digital inflation. So there's a lot of companies here at the show, I suspect, benefiting from this because there is more money being spent on content and content generation right now than ever before. And that's good news. But I do think it's a bubble that will not last too long. Um, and then digital speed, which is with all the investment these content owners are making in a content generation, they're looking for efficiencies and cost savings elsewhere in their business to help part fund that. And that's where the supply chain gets affected. Um, there are other issues at play as well. Um, and it's interesting to see that companies like Netflix, you know, their, their, their cost base is getting uh, higher and higher, not lower and lower, and they're still not making money. Uh, so there's a question about whether that business model can stand the test of time anyway. Um, and again, only, only time will tell, I think. Um, because of all that dynamics going on in the market, you know, it is the supply chain that's bearing the brunt of that. Of course, it means there's opportunity, but certainly what our members are telling us is that there's, um, there's a lot of downward pressure on pricing as well. So as we can see, the, um, this is just uh, North America, by the way. So um, Netflix and Amazon sharing about a 30% market share of the OTT in North America. And everyone else is playing for this space here. Um, and uh, that's where the, the main digital warfare in North America is happening right now. Obviously, uh, Netflix and Amazon, first mover advantage, big market share. Everyone else is playing catch up, but um, as I said before, they're not making money. So wh where's the legs in that? We don't know. The landscape um, is getting more and more crowded. More and more broadcasters and content owners are launching their own OTT or direct to consumer platform. Uh, we, we call it DTC, direct to consumer. That's the buzzword uh, right now if you're a content owner. And there seems to be two main strategies in play for a successful DTC offering. One is scale. One is get as big as you can. And the other is go niche. Um, I think if you fall in between the two, you're probably going nowhere. Um, again, time will tell whether either of those strategies are going to be successful or not. Um, if you can't quite see the figures, digital TV research claims SVOD overtook AVOD as the largest OTT revenue source in 2014 and is predicted to keep growing up to 87 billion US dollars by 2024. So North American market valued at 84 billion in 2024. It's quite a big chunk of money, right? So if your market shares 30%, that's an annual revenue of around $26 billion. That's what they're playing for. But if you can't make money with annual revenues of $26 billion, <laughs> there's something <laughs> maybe not quite right with the model. But this, this is what everyone's playing for. So when you see, in a minute, you'll see Disney's anticipated investment for 2020 alone is $1 billion. It's a lot of money. 
that this is the market share they're playing for. This is why it's interesting for them. So, um, as I said, the companies here hopefully should all be doing very well in terms of uh, business right now. Lots of investment into original content creation, mainly because all of the FANG companies, the Facebook, the Amazon, the, the Netflix, the Googles, all of those IT companies coming into the broadcast space, none of them have a back catalogue. So in order to fill up their airtime, as it used to be called, they're having to invest a serious amount of money into original content. Um, so you can see that uh, all that investment's happening. You can see who's making the investment. The investment is increasing year on year. Um, and as a result, as a consumer, uh, it's brilliant news for us, um, global SVOD subscription volumes are increasing and will continue to increase, as I say, all the way up until at least 2024. So as I just said, uh, it's a great time to be a consumer. There's lots of original content to choose from out there. And currently, uh, subscriptions are reasonably low priced. So that's, that's good news for us. It's bad time, perhaps, to be a streaming business the high investment required into generating the content and the low revenue yields um, that you get from that because of the high volume of uh, subscribers means a really long time before you get to break even. And you can see here, this is ESPN and Hulu. They're not even planning to break even until 2024, which kind of worries me slightly because the research we've got is that the market in North America for SFORD will peak at 2024. So <laughs> you've got to make sure you've got your market share, right? Um, this is a list of recent acquisitions. You probably can't see that very well, but um, this is all North American based. And we'll come on to Europe in a minute, but this is all North American based. And you can see all of the deals that have been happening among content, content owners since 2016 here, it's all acquisition based. And it's all about investing, acquiring to get scale. So in Europe, especially because of uh, public service broadcasting, um, acquisitions aren't really an op opportunity or, or, or an option. So alliances and mergers and partnerships are the way forward in Europe. Um, and, and that's what's going on here. And most of the backbone to the alliances in Europe are either based on advertising opportunities or they're based on distribution opportunities. So they're the two key drivers that are driving alliances at the moment. And what comes out of those alliances is an opportunity for vendors but um, that are selling anything to do with, with ad tech or, or distribution, basically. Um, the investment in technology will follow when there's a newly formed alliance. So as I, as I mentioned at the beginning in my headline slide, huge investment in original content means cost savings and experiences, uh, sorry, and efficiencies are sought elsewhere and everywhere. Um, and there are lots of job losses. There are lots of redundancies happening uh, in, across content owners. And there's also a change in skill set. Um, and I think it's uh, Disney here have more jobs available right now with the words IT or data in the title than they do engineering. Uh, it gives you a, a, a pretty firm indication of where their business is going uh, and the type of people and skill set that they're now looking for. So. That's the kind of overview of the drivers of change in our business right now. Uh, and we're going to look at what that means in terms of, of buying trends. So uh, the, key, the key thing is this shift to DTC, direct to consumer. Um, and any supplier involved in content uh, creation, as I said, should be doing well. And anyone involved on distribution and offering OTT or SVOD services uh, around direct to consumer should be doing as uh, uh, well as should be doing well as well um, and anyone who's offering any kind of products or services around what, what we call supply chain efficiency so anything that makes workflows more efficient anything that makes workflows more agile 
you know, dial up, dial down as and when you need it, rather than a fixed overhead all the time, uh, is where people are going to be spending money. And if you, if you distill all that down at the moment, that tends to mean cloud for most customers and AI, or as we probably should call it in this industry, machine learning. So that, if you've got any products or services on those two things, that's, that's happy days for you guys if you're selling those products. This is just a quick survey that we've done uh, that just says what we all know really, which is the mass, vast majority of media tech end users and owners already do have or have plans to provide OTT services. So this is a growing trend. This is a, a wave that's getting bigger. It's not getting smaller. So this slide's all about um, features among media tech end users of what they're looking for when choosing an OTT platform. So this is the kind of advice, if you like, that IABM has from its surveys of end customers to help our members be able to, to match the needs of those customers better by telling them the kind of things that customers are looking for. So number one feature is multi-device coverage. If you, if you have an OTT platform that's not offering that, you're not going to make a sale. Um, this is really just to say that there's, um, there's no real way forward that's clear at the moment. I mean, most prefer to outsource the deployment to an external OTT service provider rather than build an in-house facility. But as you can see, it's reasonably even Stevens. So the column on the left represents sales points to make to prospective customers to match their needs. Um, and the overview of this is that um, in, in the, I hate to use the phrase the old days, but in days gone past, technology was the main driver of change. A new technology would come out, broadcasters, content owners would rush to adopt it, and that's what would drive our business going forward. What's driving our business right now is business needs, business requirements, and business imperatives. So they are the things that are making and pushing the buying decisions right now. So as I said, if you can bring cost efficiency, workflow efficiency, or agility into any kind of customer right now, then they're the phrases that they want to hear, and that's where they're going to be spending their money. So I mentioned uh, cloud and AI, and, and they are the products that most customers are moving towards now. Um, as I say, purely simply down to efficiency and, and having a cost um, to a product that can be uh, dialed up or dialed down at, at, at a moment's notice, pretty much. Um, there's no real trend on the type of cloud used. Um, some customers prefer to outsource all of that. Some customers prefer to have it on-premise and uh, some companies can't decide what to do, so they have a hybrid of both. Um, I guess time will tell whether there's re a real trend there. I think talking to the end customers that I talk to, most of their decision revolves around uh, their view on cybersecurity. If they feel confident they can deal with cybersecurity, they'll, they'll have their cloud in-house. If they feel that's a skill set that's not really what they have or they specialize in, they'll outsource. That seems to be the key, key driver. Um, so for me, the use of cloud and AI is interdependent, both when the cloud is used for post-production collaboration to automate processes and save money, uh, but also when cloud is used for content delivery and AI is used to understand the viewer preferences and to drive greater monetization through greater information. So to me, they're both interlinked. Um, some people just use cloud for um, collaboration and workflow efficiency. The clever ones are using it for distribution as well because you apply, apply AI to that and you get a lot more information around your viewers, which makes a difference when it comes to monetization. There's also a trend among customers to build it yourself, BIY, not DIY in our, in our terminology. Um, and this is simply because sometimes what I'm hearing from customers is that there's a gap in the supply chain. No, there is a gap that no one's fulfilling and they're having to step in and build it themselves. So there is still that element out there. Um, and I think that just 
comes down to sometimes um, a lack of partnership and a lack of collaboration, really. I don't think customers are very good at talking to suppliers about what they want. And then when they do work, want, work out what they want, they want it tomorrow. And, it, you know, and, and sometimes it doesn't always work that way. Um, so that's my kind of last slide on buying trends. One thing I would say is that what I'm hearing from most of our members is that customers, uh, you know, in our industry, there are a lot of similar products and services, right? Let's be honest. And the pricing is getting more and more commoditized as well. So relationships are key, as always. Uh, these are new um, ways forward for a business. They're not entirely sure. The engineering teams are not entirely sure on the way forward. The business teams are very clear on what they want on the way forward. The engineering teams are struggling to deliver that. Um, and they're looking for confidence. And confidence comes from buying experience. So looking at the supply trends and how all of that filters down to the suppliers in our business, uh, it, it pretty much mirrors really what, what you've just seen from a buying trends perspective in the fact that um, you know, most products that are being bought at the moment are based around multi-platform content delivery, uh, workflow automation, et cetera. But um, SDI to IP is still, still quite a big project that's going on. And, and one of the things you notice, you know, um, as, you, as you travel around the world in a very cliquey small industry like broadcast is that, you know, North America and Europe are always ahead of the curve and all the other territories around the world play catch up. So, um, you know where, if, if I was selling SDI products right now, I know where I would be selling those around the world because these are the guys, the last people to adopt new technologies. So I think that's also an important um, compass to have when you're a supplier in our business, is to work out which territories are early adopters of technologies, which ones are middle adopters, which ones are late adopters, and you can expand and extend the shelf life of current products, or you know where to go first to sell new products. Um, this is just a chart that shows that 2018 was the pivotal year when software and services revenues surpassed those of hardware. So our business has been a hardware business since God was a boy. It's now a software business. 2018 was the year that defines that by terms of, of, of revenues across the whole supply chain switched from uh, hardware to software. Then if you look at just the software vendors, there's a, there's a kind of sub-trend within that, which is a trend um, for subscription revenues to be uh, pay-as-you-go based rather than license based. Um, so that's another trend where customers are wanting to pay for things as they go rather than uh, on, on a license basis. One of the things that we look at always is um, where our members can also deploy their technology. You know, broadcast and media is, a, is an industry, as we know, that demands uh, four nines, five nines uh, um, quality. So where can we transfer that, that ability and that skill set into other industries to make money? So this is just a chart that shows where, where that is at the moment. Um, education, corporate, military, sports, all of those uh, have been useful and um, uh, successful tangential industries for our members for some time. One of the newest entries uh, with big market share is eSports. So if, you're, if you haven't got an eSports client, you need to go and get one. Um, it, it is genuinely huge and massive. Not so much in Europe at the moment, but in Asia, anyone under 21 is into eSports. It's, it's just huge. Um, and it's the broadcast skill set that's really driving the growth of that business. So we have a real USP in that tangential industry. Um, so this is uh, talking to all of our members and, and having a look at um, you know, what they're saying about the industry right now. Um, it is, I think, a, 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 a depends where the, the, the value chain of broadcast the media is so long, it depends where you are in that value chain. If you're in production or if you're in distribution, you're probably doing all right at the moment. If you're anywhere in the middle, you're probably not, is the truth of it. Um, so as I've kind of mentioned, you know, the, these are 
Well, these are the key factors around uh, our members at the moment of why projects aren't happening um, or, or where their business are, is in terms of, of where they want to be and the reasons for that. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, the customers at the moment are really beating up on the supply chain in terms of pricing because of, they've got to do that in order to find this money for their original content investment. So um, it's not a great time to be a supplier in our industry, but I genuinely believe that if you remain flexible and agile yourselves and have innovation, that there are still customers that are out there who will give you airtime. One of the things that's always staggered me about this industry is the huge amount of revenue and turnover that goes into R&D every year. And that has stayed pretty much the same since I've been in this industry from 2007. So the majority of our members are spending 24, 25% of their turnover on R&D every year. Um, and that hasn't changed. Normally what happens in an industry is you, you put front load the R&D investment and then for the next 10 years, you milk all the benefit of that R&D investment and that's how you make your money back. Because of the dynamic change happening in our industry right now, because of the pace of change, you're having to keep the investment in R&D high, but you're not getting that 10 year period on the back end where you can actually take your foot off the gas and get the benefit of that investment. So it's just continual investment, investment, investment at the moment. We don't see that changing any anytime soon. Um, and I certainly know that as far as customers are concerned, they want to do business with suppliers that are continuing to do that because as they evolve and develop their roadmaps, they want to know that those suppliers can go with them and develop those products and services to how they want them. So that's me done. Um, I'll leave you with one little piece of nugget, which uh, I. I genuinely believe is true. I speak to a lot of customers in the UK and certainly on the engineering side, I can't speak for the procurement side, but certainly on the engineering side, they are looking for partners, not suppliers. Um, and that's a good thing because I think one of the strengths that our supply industry has always had has been really good at building relationships and managing those relationships. So I think that's a good thing. The only thing I would caveat is that sometimes when customers talk about partners rather than suppliers, they also want that um, emotional um, feeling to go into where the business models are concerned. So sometimes now customers are looking for uh, risk and reward share rather than buying something. So partnership does give you good opportunities to get closer to a customer, but beware, it, it, it may be leading you down a road you might not be prepared to go to. Um, certainly some customers are saying, okay, well, if that's really this good, why don't, you, why don't we do a risk and reward share? Why don't we give you half the money you want and then we'll, we'll pay you back on a per click, per view, whatever basis. So that's something else you need to be prepared for. I'm happy to take questions if anyone's got any questions. Okay, thank you very much for your time.